dirty in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Everybody grab one of these. I didn't have to. I didn't want to have to yell at y'all today and say, okay, here, write these verses now. So I went ahead and printed it up for you. If you haven't got one, I'll give you one at the end there. Those are the verses we'll be kind of going over. You'll see a couple of repeating verses, but you'll see why in a little bit why we do that. But there's your verses for today. I don't have to go and shout them out in our sermon. But I want to talk to you today about grace. It is something you don't hear too much in Christian churches, unfortunately. We need to hear more about the grace of God. And I think the problem is we have a misconception about the grace of God. Because people get a little anxious and nervous in the Christian church and they think, oh no, wait a minute. We can't be saved by grace alone. The truth of the matter is, yes, we can be saved by grace alone. Because if it wasn't for grace, if it wasn't for grace, then we wouldn't be saved. But it doesn't mean, it does not mean that we don't go and ignore God the rest of the way. We have to to be willing to be obedient to the one who offers grace. We're going to talk about that in some detail this morning here in chapter 6. We're going to start about verse 14. Okay? Verse 14. Well, let me tell you a little bit about what we are going to be discussing. Today we are in a society that thinks that they can go ahead and live in grace and continue to do whatever they want to do. We have people today that think it is okay to go and be a Christian and continue in sin. And there is a lot of sin that we have to look at. There's a lot of sin in Romans chapter 1. If you go and look, look at all the sin that's mentioned. Everybody says they pull out the big one, of course. Well, you can't be a homosexual. Well, they don't go further. They don't go and look deeper into it. Look at all the list of, of sins that are on that in chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. If you want to go to it, it's right there in verse 28. And on down. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to those things which are not proper. Be filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God. They're insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. Now, folks... Do you see yourself in any of those? Or do you see yourself in any of those in the past? Because I see a lot of me in there. <coughs> past, present, and maybe future. Because that's pretty much the litany of everything that we can do in sin. And it's more than just physical sin. It's sin in here and sin in here. Are we talking bad about people in our heads and in our hearts? Are we talking bad about people behind their back? Are we going and living a life in church that's different from the life that we're living outside the doors of church? Are we putting masks on? Are we masquerading as Christians in church and then go around out in the world and live however we want to live and choose however we want to live because we know what's right. We're in charge. We can live our life and be who we want to be. No you can't. You cannot be both Christian and worldly. You can't. And I'm about to tell you why. Because here in Romans chapter 6, we are told of the power of grace, the love, the passion, the power of grace, that which God gives us that we do not deserve. But, that leads us to salvation and sanctification. <clears throat> I want us to look at these verses. I want you to prayerfully read these with me. <clears throat> Chapter 6, verse 14, we'll read to verse 23. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? 
Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not, do you not know that when you present yourselves to be someone as uh, present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves for the one to whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that through uh, that <clears throat> pardon me. Thanks be to God that through, though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the hearts of the form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome of eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's a couple of bookends in this part right here. Now, normally I don't preach 14 along with this section because it's in a separate section that we could preach a whole other sermon on. But I wanted to bookend this because grace is so important to understand in the church. Grace is so important. Grace is the power to overcome sin, not a license to sin. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about what that phrase means. Grace is the power to overcome sin, not a license to sin. We have to be willing to trust God's grace and mercy. But that does not give us entitlement to go and continue living how we think we ought to live. In Romans 8, 2, it reads, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And in verses 12 and 13 it reads, So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Let me put it in just simple terms. I want to ask you the question, who owns you? Who owns you? Does Satan own you? Does sin own you? Does God own you? Who owns you? Now a lot of people are in there and go, hey, wait a minute. I'm not owned by anybody. I am not owned by no man, no woman, no child. I'm not owned by anybody. I'm me. I am my own person. I am not owned or controlled by anybody. <laughs> If that is your way of thinking, you've got a problem. And the problem is very simple. You're not relying on God. Simple. You're not relying on God. Who owns you? You see, whether we believe it or not, we are owned. One way or another, we're owned. Either this world owns us, or God owns us. Whether we are controlled by sin or we are controlled by righteousness. Who do we allow to lead us? Who do we allow guidance over us? For if by the transgressions of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So, if Christ has given us freedom, as Romans 5, 17 reads there. We should be as if we are calling ourselves Christians. If we are calling ourselves people of Christ. 
which is what Christian means. It means owned by Christ. If we're calling ourselves that, we need to be living by that. We need to be embracing the grace that God has given us. And thinking about what Romans 5.21 says. So that as sin reigned in death, so even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ our Lord. If we are going to live in Christ, we better start acting like it. We've got to be born again. Amen. That's it. We need more of that. You do need to be born again. Thank you. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Be unashamed. Be transformed. Be different than this world. And let me tell you something. That's one thing the book of Romans shows. It's one thing the book of Revelation shows. Y'all love that book of Revelation, but you know what's funny? <clears throat> A lot of churches don't understand what it means. They try to get a newspaper and a Bible and try to put it together. Don't do that. I want you to look at it in the eyes of the people that were there. So many times in our society and our culture, here's the church, here's culture. Here's, here's the church and here's culture. This is the way that it should go. The church should go this way, culture should go this way. But you know what's happening in our world today? They're coming together. Just as they have been coming together since the book of Revelation was composed. And do you know something? That's what's causing us problems in the church today. That is what is leading us astray today. Not the idea and principle, well, we can't get people to come to church. Do you know what the problem is? People don't want to come to a place where they feel is just like the world. We can't be like the world. We have to be changed. We have to be transparent. We need to be going as far from culture as we can. Now, some people look at me and say, well, I don't like doing these things over here. Okay, we understand that. We know. But is this more important than eternal life? That's the question we ask people. Is living for over here more important than living and receiving eternal life? We'll talk more about that in a minute. But I want you to think of it. Who owns you? Who owns you? If you're looking at that over there and say, boy, that looks good over there on that side of the field, there's danger in that. Just like my friends always told me, might look greener on the other side, but just remember, might be there is a sewage leak over there. That's why it's turning green. So guys, let me tell you something. You don't want to step in that. Okay? You don't want to be in that situation. You want to be where God is, not where everybody else is. You need to be focusing on what God wants for you. Just like I do. I have to worry about what God wants for me. And I know. I know how it is. You'll go through life and you'll think, you know, well, what am I going to do? It's always in God's time. Okay? Look what's going on right now. I'm going back to school for the first time in years. Five years. I, it's been five years since I went back to school and took a class. Now I'm going to get my bachelor's degree done and my master's started. I'm a nervous wreck. But you know something? I trust God to help me through it. I couldn't do it without him. If I did this on my own, I would fail. But with God, all things are possible. And I trust in him more than I trust me. And a lot of people say, well, you've got to trust yourself. No, I don't. I don't have to trust myself. I trust God. I trust Him. Now, I do have to go to work and I do have to do my part, yes. But I do trust God in that end, that He's going to help me through it. And that's where we need to be. That's the freedom that can be found in Christ. But I ask you again, who owns you? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. That's in John 8, 34. 
Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. So see what I'm saying? No matter how you look at it, no matter how pretty you try to paint it, I own myself. I am my own master. Let me be blunt. No, you are not. I'm my own person. No, you're not. Because if you are engaging in your own selfish exploits, you have sinned. And if you have sinned, guess what the problem becomes? If you sin, you broke the law. And thus, you can't save yourself. Thus, you have broken the law, and I got bad news for you. You're going to hell. Everybody goes to hell who don't accept God on his terms. We all do. We all deserve hell. Now, I know people hate to hear that. <gasps> He's going to preach hell by our brimstone. Yeah, because we need it. Because that's the truth. The truth is what Scripture says. There's more Scripture in here about hell and how we get to go to hell than there is about going to heaven and what heaven looks like. Why? Because Jesus is saying, you don't want to go to hell. You want to get to heaven. There is one road to heaven. And it is not something that somebody had dreamed up overseas or put somewhere else over here. It is found in God's word. It is found in God's plan. And it is found through God's son, Jesus Christ. Period. There is no other way but Jesus Christ. And that's what he says. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. If he says that, we accept that as true. And it is through that means we understand where we need to go. Salvation in that. Moreover, it is not just about going and saying, I believe in Jesus Christ. It is about coming to Him on His terms. Coming to Him on His terms. 2 Timothy 1.13 says, Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Back in Romans 8, 2 again. Remember what that said? For the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ has set you free from the law and of death. Okay? So Jesus Christ, through his grace, which is absolutely essential to salvation, because if Christ didn't come, we wouldn't be here for one thing. Two, we would still be in sin up to our eyeballs and we could not be forgiven. We'd still be sacrificing lambs and goats in the temple because we'd have to push sin back to the next year. We don't have that right now. We have grace through Jesus Christ who came and fulfilled the law. Who did what we could not do. And in Romans 6, 13, just a few verses back, do not go on presenting the members of your body as sin, as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. Now let's connect the dots back with what we've read already. Okay? Let's connect the dots. Let's see. What it says again. Start at verse 16 here. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are, uh, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either in the sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? Stop there for a minute. You're a slave no matter which path you choose. If you choose to follow yourself and say, I am my own boss, or you're saying, I want to keep on doing what I like to do, thank you very much, or you're doing that stuff, you're a slave to sin. If you are a slave to God, you come to God on His terms. You say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. I repent. I confess. I want to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is through your grace that I have this freedom to do this. Go in and you become a slave to God. Now, some people say, well, slavery isn't freedom. In Christ it is. It is freedom. Because you are not shackled with the burdens of looking forward and not seeing a bright tomorrow. You are not shackled with the pain and suffering that comes from sin. 
that this world gives. This world leads to anguish. This world leads to pain. This world leads to depression. But that road, the good road, the straight and narrow leads to salvation and sanctification. It leads to the promised land. But we have got to be willing to come to Him on His terms. He gives grace freely. But we have to seek and allow Him to be our Lord. And that means we come to Him on His terms. It is a free gift. But in order to receive that free gift, we've got to reach out and grab it, don't we? You ever turn down free gifts? Now, before you say you don't, do you think back to them credit card offers? You remember the credit card offers used to come in the mailbox all the time? You get that package and you get that little letter and you open that letter up and it would say in there, free! You get this free, this, this, this. Or what about them records? Do you all remember the record companies that used to do that? The tape companies? Remember Columbia House Records and all that? Oh, yeah, I remember those. Buy 10 albums for one penny. Remember those now? Mm -hmm. You do, don't you? Yeah, I'm getting that for nothing. <laughs> yeah. And then you're in up to your neck, right? Well, this is not the kind of offer that God gives you. God doesn't cost, it doesn't cost you a dime to come to God. It just costs you your life. Now a lot of people look at me and say, it's quite a bit. Yes it is. Because you've got to let him have you. You've got to give up everything you were to become who you need to be. Look at what the scripture says. Look what that scripture says. Look back here at 17. Look at 16. Look what it says. Slaves of obedience, you are slaves to one whom you obey, either to sin resulting in death or, and, or obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching in which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You understand? If you're accepting Christ, you're choosing to be a part of Him. The word is doulos. To be a servant that you choose to be the servant. It's a it is a servant by choice. And so, became doulos of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of weakness of our flesh. For just as you presented yourselves members and slaves of impurity to lawlessness, okay? Let's break this down a little at a time. Because you have been sinful people and you lived in sin and you were slaves to sin and you continue to press on in sin and keep doing sin. And what happens when you keep on doing sin? You keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into sin, don't you? That's what happens. Because it says it right there. Impurity and lawlessness resulting in further lawlessness. So now present yourselves, okay? Just like you did back then, I want you to present yourselves as members, as slaves to righteousness resulting in sanctification. Y'all remember what sanctification is? You can tell, you can yell it out. If you know it, say it. What's it mean? What's sanctification mean? Purify, part of it, but you're what? You're set apart. That's right. You're set apart for a holy purpose. That's where we get the word saint from. If you're a Christian, you are a saint. You don't have to be worrying about putting into a book or get canonized. You don't have to worry about that. You're already canonized. You're in the book of life. You don't have to worry about somebody else in a building putting your name in a book in order to be a saint. No. You're a saint when you become one with Christ. When you go, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and walk in the newness of life. At that newness of life, when you come up out of that water and you're a new man or a new woman or a new creation in Christ, guess what? You're a saint. You are who Paul is talking to. He says to the saints in Rome, well, guess what? You're saints. And you are are changed 
transformed and made different. And so if you're made different, it means you need to live different. You have to stay there, though. You can't back up. Keep running the race, right? What do you do? Amen. Keep running the race. I love it. I like when people get involved because that's what it's about, man. Run that race together. We run that race together. You, me, we run this race together. It is not a 10-yard dash to the baptistry, and that's it. That's the start of the race. That's the gun going on. What needs to be done is we need to continue the marathon that gets to heaven. And so we keep running the race. And we keep running that race together. And we build ourselves to be encouraged and inspired by God. We are not perfect. We're not. But in order to help one another, we keep encouraging one another, building one another, strengthening one another, building ourselves up in the name of Jesus Christ and keep running the race together. Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters for he either hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what? You can't serve God and the world. You can't. There is no way of serving God and the world. You have to choose one or the other. And that's the hardest thing. People say, well, I don't like some of this stuff over here. Okay, we understand. You're going to, we're going to interact with the world. We're going to watch TV. We're going to do things like that. But are you going to let... That stuff control what you do over here at church? Are you going to let that control what you do when your free time is available? All your free time? You know what I mean? Because, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm all for taking a vacation. I love taking a vacation. I love getting away. I love being on. But what are you doing on the Lord's Day? Are you going to church? Are you avoiding church at all costs? Because I'm on vacation. I'm on vacation with God. I'm on vacation with this. I'm on vacation with if you're on vacation from God, you've got a problem. Because God's right there beside you. Take time out to recognize who's in charge of your life and who's giving you the blessings in your life. Be transformed. Be changed. Be different. And give God the glory. Take time out to give Him the thanks. Romans 6.16, do you not know that when you present yourself someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness. We read that. And the reason I put it back down there and repeated that is because that goes right with this idea. Who will you choose? Which will you choose? The wage or the gift? What are you going to choose? Are you going to choose the wage of sin, which is death, or are you going to choose the way or the gift of life, which is salvation and eternal life in Jesus Christ? You notice, verse 23 doesn't have any gray area in it. You notice that? For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Read that. There's no grave. There's no, well, you can go back over here now and again and then come back over here. There's no gray area. There's no middle ground. There's no fence. You've got to fight it all, all the time. All the time, every day, seven days a week, 365, next year, 366 days of the year. You've got to be willing to fight it all the time because this is the race we're running. And that is why it is so important for us to embrace God's grace because we cannot do it on our own. We can't. It's impossible. For we, for he who called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freeman. And likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. 1 Corinthians 7.22 1 Peter 2.16 Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil but use it as bond slaves of God. Are we getting the picture? We can't wear masks. We've got to take the masks off. We've got to throw them down. We've got to crush them under our feet because that's what Satan wants us to do. Satan wants us to wear masks. 
He wants us to look all good and godly in here. But then when we leave out here, he wants us to live like he's like he's our boss, like he's the one in charge, like he's the one that's got the shackles on us. And if we're living in sin, you better believe that's what we're doing. But that's not what God wants. You see, God wants us to be willing to trust him and follow him. John 8, 31 to 32 says, Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, said, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. I don't want to preach my opinion in the pulpit, and I'm not going. That's why I trust in God's Word. God's Word is the means of freedom. God's grace will always trump sin. God's love will always trump sin. God's righteousness will always trump sin. It will always defeat sin. It will always stop sin at the source. It puts an end to the old man and brings out the new. But you've got to be willing to give it up. You've got to be willing to let go of the old man. Get rid of it. Be changed through Jesus Christ, through His grace, His free gift of grace. What do I need to do? Grab on to that free gift of grace. What did He say to do? What did John say? What was I? If you believe me, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through him, right? Well, that's part of it. Believing in that's the first part of it. Believing in him, trusting in him. Then going and repenting. Turning your life over. Completely over. Not hanging on to a few things. I know, I've hung on to a few things in the past. You've got to let go of them. If anger's holding you back, let go of it. If, if some sin, some secret sin in your little closet is holding you back, let go of it. Get rid of it. If alcohol, drugs, or anything else is holding you back, get rid of it. Let go of it. There's no greater drug in this world than Jesus Christ. He will deliver you, free you, and give you strength every single day. But you've got to believe in it. You've got to repent. You've got to turn your life over to Him. You've got to confess the name of Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. Those are not if and statements. Those are 100% connected statements. And Lord and Savior. Both Savior and Lord. If He's Lord of your life, you're going to listen to Him. He says, go and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be baptized. Be changed. And when you come up out of that water, be transformed. Be changed. 